In this video, we'll take a deeper dive into the life cycle of the memory that your program will use while it's running. Let's start by taking a look at what happens when you first launch a program. The first step of this process is controlled by your operating system, and it will allocate some virtual address space to use for the process. One of the main reasons for creating this virtual address space is for security reasons. It means that your program is only allowed to address memory from within its virtual address space instead of being able to access memory from other processes. This fact becomes important later on when we start talking about multiprocessing. This virtual address space maps regions of virtual addresses to real addresses that are stored on your RAM chip. Once the address space is created, we can then copy the instructions from the program file itself into memory. Along with these machine instructions, we'll also copy along some constant data that your program will need to operate as well. These two regions are often read-only, and so we need another region of memory that is dedicated to storing dynamic results, things that we can read to and write from. For reasons that we'll investigate in this video, we usually split the dynamic memory region into two different segments, one called the stack and the other one called the heap. One thing to notice about these two regions is that there is a portion of empty space in between them. This is so that the stack and the heap can grow independently without interfering with one another. On all systems, memory is a finite resource, and so in general we want our program to use as few resources as it needs to complete the tasks that we give it. Ideally, when your program starts, the stack and the heap will be a small size. As your program starts running, the stack and the heap will grow to accommodate the new runtime information that it needs to continue processing. Notice that the stack will grow downwards towards the heap, whereas the heap will grow upwards. As resources are typically quite finite on a machine, you don't want your process to continue growing in its memory consumption. You want some mechanism to try and reduce the memory usage of your process, as it no longer needs the memory that it's previously been allocated. Often during the execution of your program, the stack and the heap will grow and shrink depending on fluctuations in the memory requirements. The main difference between these two regions of memory is how we allocate space within them and deallocate space once it's no longer needed. To start with, let's look at how the stack operates. First, let's start with the name. Stack refers to a type of data structure which follows the first in, last out principle. One analogy for the stack is the stack of paper that you put into an empty printer tray. The paper that you put in last, i.e. the top sheet, will get used first by the printer. Another example of a stack can be seen in the game Towers of Hanoi, where only the top ring is allowed to be moved from each stack. The stack is a very useful and interesting data structure, but it is also used as an integral part to how your program actually executes. Its main purpose is to facilitate function calls and store local variables that are required for a function's execution. To have a look at how this works, let's look at an example function. We've seen the factorial before on this course, but this time the function is written recursively. On the right, I've shown an area of memory that can be used to represent the stack itself. And remember, memory is just a big table of data with each address indexing uniquely one byte of data within this table. So now that we have our stack, let's see how this function is executed for an example function call. The entry point for this function, I'll just choose to be factorial of three. So the input value n will be equal to three on our first round. We'll put this pointer in the first memory address available for our stack. We also introduce a stack pointer, which allows us to find out what the next free address in the stack will be. When we first call into this function, we have an input argument, which is stored in a local variable n. In order for the function to have access to this variable, it needs to be stored somewhere in memory. We put this memory onto the stack. When we add to the stack, we push the data in the next available address in memory and update the stack pointer. In this case, I've also introduced an orange arrow on the left-hand side, which points to the current line that we are executing. The next step in our function is a comparison operation, which compares the local variable n to one. This value of n is stored on the stack and can be accessed by our function. In this case, the value of n is three, and so our condition isn't satisfied, and so we jump directly to line five. On this line, we're calling the factorial function again with an input of n minus one. Whenever we call a function, we will evaluate the arguments first. In this case, n minus one will give us two. For this example, I'm not going to push this value two onto the stack, and you can assume that this simple result can just get stored inside of the CPU's registers. Instead, we'll push a pointer onto the stack, which helps us remember which instruction we were executing before we called the factorial function again. Once we've pushed the pointer, we can also push the arguments that are required for execution of this function. This is where we push the evaluated argument two onto the stack. Again, we evaluate the condition, this time using n equals two. As this condition still returns false, we'll jump directly into line five. 
and we'll follow the same process as before. Since we're calling into the function factorial again, we'll push this pointer onto the stack. And again, we're assuming that we can evaluate n minus one inside the CPU's registers. Once we're executing this function, we need to push the input argument onto the stack again. Here, we're pushing the evaluated argument n equals one onto the stack. And all of this time, we're updating the stack pointer to help us keep track of what the next available address in memory is. Finally, on this round of the execution, the condition n double equals one will evaluate to true. And this is the first example that we've seen of a function returning a value. In this case, the value returned is just one. But once the function has finished executing, the local variables are no longer needed. And so we need a way to be able to clean up this memory allocated to n equals one. On the stack, this is a very simple and easy process since we can just move the stack pointer up to the previous address. Notice that here we're not actually overwriting the memory at all. All we're doing is moving the stack pointer and we're considering any address onwards from the stack pointer as free memory that can be used later on. Not only is it very easy to deallocate memory using the stack, but also we can help facilitate our function calls. In the last address of memory, we've kept a pointer that helps us keep track of the last instruction that we were executing before we called the factorial function. What's very useful here is we can replace the pointer with the return value of the function that we just evaluated. And in this case, we assign this value into the variable last factorial. The last popped pointer allowed us to continue execution straight from line five. And we still have the variable n equals two as it wasn't overwritten by future function calls. On the next line six, we'll need these variables n and last factorial to multiply together to give the return value. Here I'm assuming that this intermediate value isn't stored on the stack and again is just stored inside of the CPU's register. But since we're finished executing these functions, the memory for n equals two and last factorial need to be cleaned up. And again, this is as easy as just moving the stack pointer back to the previous function call. And remember the return value of two times one is just stored in a register and we'll eventually add it to the stack. But first we need to pop the pointer so that we know which instruction to execute next. And now we can push the return value of two, which was the evaluation from the last function call. We can assign this into the variable last factorial. And now we can continue with the rest of our function evaluation. And so we will evaluate line six next by multiplying the values n equals three multiplied by last factorial equals two. In this case, our return value will be six. And again, once the function has calculated its return value, it no longer needs to store the local variables n equals three and last factorial equals two. And so we need to free this memory. And so we just move the stack pointer up to the last function call. Here we can pop this instruction pointer so that we know which place to continue our execution from once we finished evaluating factorial of three. And finally, we can pop the final instruction pointer so we know where to continue execution after evaluating factorial of three. We can put the result of evaluating this function inside the stack for later use. Notice that at all stages of this execution, we didn't have to overwrite any memory and memory allocation was as simple as moving the stack pointer up and down and copying the values that we needed into the stack. So let's quickly summarize what the stack is useful for. First, the stack forms an integral part of how function calls are evaluated. It's the place where local variables are stored inside memory. Before we color coded the memory that was local to a specific function call, and these regions of memory are called stack frames. Along with local variables, a stack frame will usually contain metadata that helps the control flow of your program, including the pointer to the next instruction to execute once a function returns. Whenever a function returns, we have to deallocate the memory that was used to store the local variables. In this case, we just move the stack pointer up. What's important to remember is this data is not explicitly overwritten or managed. All we're doing is updating the stack pointer. Because we're just moving a stack pointer, allocation and deallocation is very fast when we're using the stack. So whenever we want to call a new function and allocate a new stack frame, we can simply just move the stack pointer to compensate. And then once we no longer need that memory, we can simply move the stack pointer back to a previous reference point. Now the stack is incredibly useful, especially for executing functions, but it has a few restrictions as well. The first restriction is that all objects that you put onto the stack must have known size at compile time. If an object size isn't known ahead of time, how do we know how far to move the stack pointer so that we point to the next free address in memory? The amount that we move the stack pointer is usually encoded directly inside the instructions that are executing. The second restriction is that function return values need to be copied up the stack. This can be very inefficient if you have very large objects that are stored on the stack. As an example, imagine you've called a function that creates a very large array. This function may also have some local variables inside as well. 
If the function wants to return the array that was created, we can't simply just move the stack pointer up, we have to copy all of the values inside the array up the stack, so that the old memory used by local variables can be overwritten and is freed up. Copying these large arrays can be quite inefficient and slow, and so in general it's not the best idea to store these values on the stack. Instead, we usually work with pointers to data that's stored in a different location. In particular, these objects are stored in the heap, which is what we'll talk about next. The heap is the other region of memory that we can use to store runtime information. You can think of the heap as an arena of memory, and it can be used to store arbitrary amounts of runtime data within your process's memory. Inside this arena, we keep track of which spaces are free and which are allocated. When you want to store something in this region of memory, you have to make a request to allocate some memory within the heap. When you do this, a process will spin up that will try to look for a chunk that's big enough to store the data that you want. Once it's found a space that's big enough for your data, the space is then allocated and a pointer is returned for you to use that region of memory. When each new request comes in, this process is repeated. The allocator will make sure that it finds you a slot that is big enough to store all of your data in a contiguous block. If there's not enough free space available in the current size of the heap, the process will request additional memory from the operating system in order to store this new data. The allocations that are made are referenced by pointers, and the pointers will just reference the starting memory address of your allocated block. Usually there's another mechanism that helps keep track of the size of the allocation, or in a metadata field that's bundled alongside the pointer. The pointers can be stored on the heap so that objects within the heap can point at memory elsewhere in the heap, or you can store the pointers directly in the stack itself to reference the memory there. Using pointers to reference this memory is quite efficient because if you want a function to be able to access that memory, you don't need to copy all of that memory into the stack, you can simply pass a pointer that references the memory that you wish to share. One problem with the heap is that it will fill up over time as more and more allocations are made. Eventually it will become necessary to deallocate the unused memory so that it becomes easier to find free space in the future, and so that your program only uses the memory that it needs to function. The strategies used to clean up memory inside the heap varies depending on the programming language. In this video we'll focus on just two strategies for dealing with memory management on the heap. One of the first strategies for managing this heap is to do so manually, and so in languages like C, the programmer has to specify when to allocate memory and when to free memory. If you've written programs in C before, you'll be very familiar with this. Now in this code snippet, we can see an example of how we allocate memory. In particular, we have very low level control over how memory is allocated. We use this function malloc, which stands for memory allocate. This runs a program which searches memory for a contiguous block of the specified size. In this case, we give it a size of n times the size of int, and so this is specifying the number of bytes that we want to store within our block. This process will then go and find the memory allocation and return the pointer to this block. As this is just a pointer, we can pass it between various functions and use it however we need to. We can then continue to use this data to perform any of the processing tasks that we need to do. But once we finish using this memory, it's our responsibility to clean up this memory so that it can be used again later down the line. In C, we use this free function to indicate that the memory stored at a particular location should be freed and is available to be reused by future allocation requests. If the programmer forgets to do this within their program, it can lead to what's known as a memory leak. Manually managing your memory gives you a lot of control over the performance characteristics of your code. Having this low level control over how memory is allocated and deallocated can enable the programmer to perform a lot of different performance optimizations, which is one of the many reasons why C, C++ and Fortran are used for high performance programming applications. However, manual memory management comes at a cost. The first main cost is on the programmer's time itself. It's not always easy to write code that is free from memory leaks. If the programmer gets this wrong, not only does it open up your program to performance degradation in the form of a memory leak, but it can also introduce security vulnerabilities in your program as well. As this process has caused a lot of frustration for many programmers over the decades, many modern programming languages try to do away with manual memory management, and instead rely on a different process to help clean up the memory. Garbage collection is one of the most dominant strategies for managing memory amongst modern programming languages. If you've ever written a language that didn't require you to manually free your memory, it's very likely that you were using a garbage collector, unless you were writing it in a language like Rust, which has its own special system for dealing with memory. Now I think it's important for us to look at an example. So here we have this function that estimates pi by using a Monte Carlo method. 
The specifics of how this works aren't really important, and we'll just focus on how memory is used throughout the execution of this function. The first line I want to focus on is this call to rand. Now this specific syntax will create an array which has n rows and two columns. Obviously here, n depends on the input to the function. The exact amount of space required to store this array isn't known until runtime, because n isn't known during compilation. In Julia, whenever we allocate an array, it will get stored on the heap automatically. And so this region of memory is now reserved for the data stored by the darts variable. On the next line, we can see a few more allocations. The argument that's passed into sum creates another array of the same size as darts, and so this too ends up on the heap but notice that the original block of memory still exists. But not only does this line allocate an array to store the input argument for the function, it also allocates an array when returning the result sum. Here we're summing over each row in the array, and so the result is a vector of length n. This also has to be stored on the heap as well, so now we have three arrays that exist on the heap. So now we'll move on to the final line, which also allocates a new array. This time the array is allocated only for the input argument. Here we're creating a new array which stores booleans either 0 or 1 for whether a particular radius was less than 1. The result of the sum function is just a scalar and that can be stored on the stack. So in total, this function has allocated four arrays. And at no point are there any statements to free this memory for later use. But notice that this memory is not actually referenced anywhere. So we can't actually access the memory that we've allocated before, it's just sitting there on the heap. Once this function completes, there are no references to the memory that we've allocated that still exist. These references would have been stored on the stack, and as soon as the function returns, that memory is lost to us. So now let's look at the consequences of this memory allocation in a wider context. Let's say we have another function main, which prints out 10 estimates of pi, all using 100 random samples. After one iteration of this for loop, the estimatePy function will have allocated four arrays on the heap. Again, when the function returns, these arrays are not automatically cleaned up. On the next iteration, we also need another four arrays to store all of this information. So you can start to imagine, as we call this function more and more, our heap will start to fill up and it will become harder and harder to find free memory to store our new arrays. On the third iteration of our loop, the heap is practically full and there are no contiguous blocks that are big enough to store the arrays that we need. In this case, the Julia runtime will trigger garbage collection. The garbage collector is a process that goes through all of the allocations in your heap and tries to remove allocations that are no longer needed. We're simplifying the process here, but essentially we look at all the blocks of allocated memory and mark all of the allocations that are no longer referenced by any active variables. In this case, all of our current allocations are no longer required because there are no longer any active references to these blocks of data since all of the variables that reference these blocks have gone out of scope. So now that the blocks that can be cleaned up have been successfully identified, they can be once again marked as free space and able to be used by future allocations. And now we have space for all of the new allocations that are required by the estimatePy function. Now this method of handling memory is very friendly towards the programmer. We don't need to chase down all of our allocations and make sure that we're freeing the memory. We have a process that automatically does this for us, but this convenience comes at a heavy performance cost. The main problem with garbage collection is it's a process that takes a lot of time and it requires the execution of your program to actually pause while the garbage collector does its job and cleans up your memory. If your code is full of allocations, it's likely that this is putting a lot of pressure on the garbage collector. If the allocations build up too much, the garbage collector will trigger and will pause execution of your program. And this is a very important fact to remember. Your code is essentially interrupted every time the garbage collector needs to run because it needs to freeze what memory is being used so the garbage collector can assess which memory is no longer needed and can be freed for future use. Now this is not to say that allocations are necessarily bad. In general, allocations are necessary for the normal functioning of a program. But if you have excessive allocations in your code, this can lead to poor performance. And it's something that you might want to investigate when you're optimizing your code. In the next video, we'll see the performance impact of excessive allocations on your code. We'll also run through a series of optimization techniques that you can use to reduce the allocations in your code and improve the performance.